So we, here we are in Mark chapter 1. I'm picking up in verse 21. It says, They went to Capernaum, and, on, uh, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Well, it's kind of, I'll pause right here. What's kind of interesting, like, in this time, it was kind of common for a synagogue to have, like, an open mic session, basically. You know, someone could come in and teach, as long as they, you know, were versed in the, uh, versed in the law and versed in the scriptures, someone could come in and teach. It was usually like a scribe. Uh, the Pharisees that you hear about in the scripture, the Pharisees were, were a religious party, and so, like, not, like, there was, you know, there's a, what do they call it, a Venn diagram, the circles, like there, there's some overlap. A lot of Pharisees were scribes and a lot of scribes were Pharisees. I think. So they would, they would be in the synagogue teaching. Continuing in verse 23, just then a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit, a.k.a. a demon, um, cried out, what do you want with this Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently, and he came out with a shriek. The people were all so amazed, and they asked each other, What is this, a new teaching with authority? He even gives orders to the impure spirits, and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. Very interesting here, like... They're asking, like, who is this that is teaching with such authority? Like, this authority felt really foreign to them. They were just amazed, like, at this just, you know, confidence and this power and this authority that Jesus was teaching with. It was like, he wasn't, Jesus wasn't just merely quoting another rabbi or just reading from the scriptures, which was often the case in this, when the teaching was happening in the synagogue. They were just kind of reading it off. He was teaching as someone with, authority with power with with firsthand experience it's almost like if you were hearing about a football game from two people one person who just read the stat sheet like oh man last week Dak Prescott threw for 400 yards and two touchdowns he dropped back 58 times and completed 48 of those passes and that actually this is actually real like these are the real stats Tom Brady, the dirty cheater, dropped back 48 times and threw for 380 yards and three touchdowns. Ezekiel Elliott carried the ball 11 times for 33 yards. Amari Cooper, you know, I just all, like just reading off these stats. But if you weren't there, but if someone there is like, dude, man, Dak was back there and Zeke threw up this awesome block and leveled this guy out and Dak threw this bomb and people were going crazy. Like the experience of a football game from someone who was there and someone who just read about it would be very different, right? Like, someone who was there could, like, describe the smells and just, like, the energy in the room and the, the crowd going crazy and seeing these guys fight and, you know, the things that don't make it on the stat sheets or, you know, the pressure on the quarterback or the blocks and, you know, the things that are just kind of between the lines, someone would be able to relay that information to you. And Jesus is teaching the scriptures as one who was there from the beginning. Like when the earth was created, Jesus is like, y'all, dude, I was there. In Isaiah, when it says he was bruised for our transgressions and our, by, our, by his stripes we were healed, he's like, spoiler alert, that's me. You know, Jesus is teaching with this firsthand knowledge when Abraham took Isaac to be sacrificed and God gave a substitutional sacrifice by speaking through the burning bush and providing a ram or I'm getting these stories. Maybe by Brian the Ram, you know, Jesus is like, I was there. So Jesus is teaching the scripture with an authority that the people had never seen before. His connection to scripture and the connection to his father gave him an uncommon and very compelling authority that the people had never seen before. And what's really awesome is later in Jesus' teaching, you see in Matthew chapter 10, he would later tell the disciples that through him, they have the same authority. In chapter 10, verse 1, Jesus called his 12 disciples to him, and he gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 16 through 20, what we would call the Great Commission, says the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, 
all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them everything I have commanded to, with you. And surely I am with you to the very end of the age. Jesus is saying, Jesus will later say, this authority, this power, this confidence that I'm teaching in, that you guys are so amazed by, guess what? Through me, you will have this same authority. Through me, you will have the same connection to the Father, right? So the, the, the concept of being connected to the Heavenly Father was really foreign to, to people at this time. Something that we take for granted, just being able to pray in and, and Jesus' name and the atonement that we get through Jesus Christ, something that we find very normal would have been very foreign to the people of the day. And Jesus is saying, through me, you have this connection. Through me, you have the authority and the confidence to teach the Scripture as I teach the Scripture. If you want to do like Jesus do, if you want to teach like Jesus, Jesus teach, you got to be like Jesus be. I'm, I'm getting this mixed up. But anyway, but and I, what I think is really interesting here as we move through this passage of scripture, you know, down in uh, the Jesus was immediately known by the demon. You know, Jesus walks in the door and that demon knows what's up. He's like, he immediately says, what do you want with us, Jesus of, Naz Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus basically just said, shut your fat mouth. <laughs> like he, did, he, didn't, he didn't give this demon any time. Because you know what? Dude, the demons are liars. The enemy is a liar. You know, Jesus had just come out of the, the wilderness where Satan himself was tempting Jesus. Oh, if you just bow to me, I'll give you all these kingdoms. Or you just call down food from heaven. Like, dude, the devil's a smooth talker, y'all. He will make you believe things that aren't true. Dude, sometimes those voices, you know, like, it's not super common that we would meet someone who's possessed by a demon. It's not that common, but you know what is common? Having your anxiety, like, speak to you and tell you you're not good enough. Having your, your fear and depression and anxiety crush down upon you and tell you all these things that aren't true. Like, if I can be really honest, I, like, I've been kind of struggling with that lately. Like, the other day... Like, I thought I was going to get fired. Like, I don't know why, but it's like fear and anxiety will tell you these lies. And then all of a sudden, they won't tell you these lies. They'll tell you, oh, they'll give you like a list of reasons. You know what I mean? Like, oh, man. <laughs> they'll give you all these reasons that these lies should be true. And every single one of those is false. You know, it's the fear and the the anxiety, that's, those are all just lies. And, and that's why Jesus is telling, in fact, you see the scriptures a lot, Jesus doesn't even give demons a chance to speak. He just immediately says, be quiet, silent. How many of you guys have seen the movie Luca? If you got kids, you may have seen it. It's a, it's a cartoon movie. And there's this one scene where these two kids are about to do something kind of crazy. And one of them goes, Silencio Bruno. And he's like, what are you talking about? He's like, oh, well, that, that feeling you feel inside of you that's trying to tell you to stop, that this is crazy. Well, I named that feeling Bruno. And I tell Bruno to shut up. And he's like, and so, and so sometimes, I know it's easier said than done, but sometimes when those voices are, are telling you, hey, don't do that, or... You know, like if you see someone that, that you feel might need encouragement, that, might, that you have like a word from the Lord to a person and all of a sudden this like fear kind of cripples you and you're like, oh, no, 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 I can't say that. Like, I don't, I'm, I'm not a good enough Christian. I've, I haven't been a Christian long enough or, you know, I, I'm not strong enough. I'm not brave enough to do all these things. Like that's, you know, you can just say, you know, silencio, Bruno, right? <laughs> But Jesus, and we can follow Jesus' example, and Jesus immediately put the kibosh on those demons saying, silence. And then he told them to get out. And so like Jesus is teaching with this authority that right away the demons knew who he was. And the right away the demons listened to him. And the people, the people were kind of astonished. Like they've never seen anything like this before. Um, so yeah. Continuing on uh, in the scripture, if you jump down to verse 29, as we're moving through this passage, it says, As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon, also called Peter, uh, Simon's mother-in-law, was in bed with fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, and he took her hand to help her. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them, or she began to serve them. 
That evening in sunset, the people were brought to Jesus, all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered, and Jesus healed many of various diseases, and he drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because he knew who he was, or because they knew who he was. Jesus is getting popular fast. He's getting well-known fast. I guess, you know, this was like the viral sensation of the day, right? You know, if Jesus had TikTok, there would have been those videos all over. Anyway, so Jesus is getting popular fast. The word is spreading throughout the entire country. Man, this guy, Jesus, is healing people. He's casting out demons. The demons are like afraid of him. He's teaching with this authority that we've never seen before. And so people are really starting to come from all over. And, you know, if... If you're getting really popular, you know, stuff like that can kind of go to your head. But we say, we say something around here at the sanctuary that uh, the Holy Spirit, Jesus, will stop a service just to touch one person. Amen. Jesus did this here. Like he's teaching and the crowds are following him. They're trying to find him. But he took time to go into a home where no one was watching and just two or three people and heal Simon Peter's mom. Like, there was no recognition, there was no pat on the back, there was no waves of crowd going, Jesus, Jesus, ah. You know, there was, there was none of this outward acclamation or outward, you know, cheer for Jesus, but Jesus is still, he's ministering to many, you know, you know huge crowds, but yet he's still taking the time to come in and find someone and heal them in private. It's also worth pointing out to me that it says, says, so he took her hand, helped her up, the fever left, and she began to serve them. If you have an encounter with Jesus, if you have a life-changing encounter with Jesus, you look at like Paul on the way to Damascus. Like once his life was changed, he couldn't help but serve Jesus. You know, I see in the story of my friend Bobby here, you know, he's like, man, if you haven't hung out with this dude, you need to find this guy and you need to talk to him. Like, just Bobby and Serena, both, the energy that just comes out of both of them, like how much they serve Jesus. Dude, let me tell you, uh, Bobby, Zach, Stace, they were here doing yard work and no one asked them to and no one paid them to do it. And they're just here because they love Jesus, because Jesus has touched their lives, and it's just overflowing out of their lives. So Peter's mom was the same way. Like, Jesus healed her, and she's like, hey, you guys want some pancakes? Like, she just got up right away, and, like, she's serving. Like, she was so touched and so inspired that she couldn't help but just, you know, try to serve. And, and, and it's not even like trying to pay back. She's just so overcome by joy and so overcome by love that it's just a, a natural outflow of who she was and who she became. And so that's kind of like us. When we have this like encounter with Jesus, our natural outflow should be to love others in big ways and in small ways. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's doing yard work. Sometimes it's giving someone a ride to a sober house. Sometimes it's just praying for someone. You meet someone, you know, uh, Bill over here drives, uh, when, when he's driving around, just sharing the gospel with people, listening to the Holy Spirit, and just being obedient. When you've had an encounter with Jesus, your natural expression is just for that to outflow out of who you are. Yeah. Moving on in the passage, verse 35, it says, Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up. He left the house and he went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his com uh, companions went to look for him. When they found him, they exclaimed, everyone's looking for you. Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching their synagogues and driving out demons. Jesus, the son of God, God come in flesh on earth, still took time to be alone still took time to pray and hang out with the Father. If you don't take anything else away from this, take away this, that even Jesus took time to pray in solitude. If you want to do like Jesus do, you got to be like Jesus be. Jesus took time to pray in the quiet. He took time to hear the Father's voice. You know, one of the benefits of finding that quiet place and getting into the scriptures is you start to learn what the voice of God sounds like, what the heart of God sounds like. Because there's a lot of voices trying to influence us, right? Whether it be through social media or people, just random people on the street, that anxiety that's in the back of your head. There's a lot of voices that are trying to influence us. 
But if we can become so familiar with the voice of God, with the heart of God, we can start sifting through and focusing in on the voices that really matter. In John chapter 10, verses 1 through 5, it says, He says, Very truly, I tell, uh, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. And they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Hearing the voice of God, being comfortable with it, being confident that you know that this is what God is telling you can help you eliminate some of those other voices that are coming against you, can help you really filter down and know the heart of God. And that can be found through reading the scriptures. That can be found through taking time in a quiet place to pray. Um... I'm going to invite the worship band to come back up. Charles Spurgeon once said, Woe unto that man whose devotion is observed by everybody and who never offers a secret supplication. Secret prayer is the secret of prayer, the soul of prayer, the seal of prayer, the strength of prayer. If you do not pray alone, you do not pray at all. I care not whether you pray in the street or in the church or in the barrack room or in the cathedral, but your heart must speak with God in secret or you have not prayed. That was Charles Spurgeon. The importance of finding that quiet place, the importance of finding the voice of God, learning the voice of God, hearing the voice of God. So as I'm wrapping up, I, you know, I want to open up. Uh, you guys are welcome to come up to the front and pray. If you've been hearing the voices that are telling you lies, it's time to like find a spot and hear the voice of God, to find that quiet place and listen. And what's really cool about like hearing the voice of the Father, um, you know, as a parent, like my kids know my voice. If I'm calling out their name, looking for them, or if I'm you know loving on them, or if I'm frustrated with them, my boys know my voice. But you know what? I know their voice too. I know their voice very well. And I can hear, you know, when they're, when they're making like their screams and their cries and their noises and their yells, like, like I know like, oh, that, that scream means I'm in pain or that means I'm afraid or, oh, they're just playing. They're just laughing. They're okay. Like I, like I know that like they don't even have to use words and I can tell by like the inflection of their voice. Like I know their voice so close. Listen, The Father knows your voice. And when you cry out to him, God, I need you. God, I can't do this alone. God, I'm at the end of my rope. God, this chemical, this image, this computer, this relationship, whatever it is, I can't let go of it. God, I need you to help me. God hears your voice and he knows your voice and he he will meet you where you're at. In the quiet places of your life, in the stillness, God is speaking to you. And when you're crying out to him, he is hearing those prayers. We've been praying for recovery revival. And it's, we're going to have the great drug exchange here in a couple weeks. There's a lot of our friends and neighbors here living on the streets not living on the streets, people in, people in little houses, people in big houses. Drug addiction is no respecter of race, religion, income bracket, neighborhood. When those claws of addiction get into people, man, it messes them up and they can't get rid of it. And he, like rich folks and poor folks, like it don't matter. And so we're praying for people to come in and cry out to their father. So God has the chance to reach down and help break those chains. You guys can join me in this if you like. It says, Abba, Father, your sons and daughters, our brothers and sisters are addicted. It feels so hopeless at times, but we know you are above any obstacle because your name is hallowed and above every other name. 
this brings us hope. May your kingdom of freedom come to those who have come to the end of their rope. May your will be done for those who feel undone. For those who feel as though heaven is fleeting and far away, may it be as near as the soil to the sole of their feet. Give us what we need to help our brothers and sisters on their journey. Give them what they need to take the next right step. As we walk together, let forgiveness lead the way. Deliver us from all darkness. Drive us all toward the light. This is your, your story. Only your power can do this. You deserve the glory. Amen. Amen. The worship band's going to play for a little while. I want to encourage you guys, find a spot. Listen to the voice of God. Call out to him. If, if this card is you, if you're our brothers and sisters who are in bondage of addiction, whether that addiction is a chemical, whether it's a relationship, whether it's an image on a computer screen, whatever that addiction is, God is here to set you free. We often say God loves you as you are, not as you should be, because none of us are ever as should be. None of us are as we should be. But He also loves you enough to not leave you there. Call out to God, because He knows your voice, and listen for His voice. Amen. Thanks for tuning in to a message from the Sanctuary Church. For more information and media, go to our website at thesanctuarywestside.org or follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube. 